All right. Well, welcome y'all. Um, my name is Whitney Irwin. It is January 21st, 2024, which is crazy to me. We are almost through with January. It feels like it was literally October. Um, but I am a GMAT, GRE, and EA instructor here at Manhattan Prep. And you are joining us for a free prep hour. Um, tonight's free prep hour is going to focus on the verbal section of both the classic and the focus. Um, for those of you that are here live, there are 10 days left of GMAT Classic. Um, if you are joining me on the recording, likely this recording is now up after uh, GMAT Classic is gone and we are fully in the world of GMAT Focus. So um, here we go. So tonight's lesson is going to be about reading comprehension. And um, I just, I feel like we don't spend enough time focusing on how we can improve in reading comp. And now that it really is kind of a heavy hitter in our verbal section of the test, it and critical reasoning are the only two we have, um, I think it's more and more important. And so I thought we could do like a nice broad overview, but really focus in on one of my favorite skills, which is the skill of prediction. So working to predict an answer before we actually go to our answer choices. So this is going to be very different from the way that we handle the other verbal question type on the focus, critical reasoning. So in order to get started, let me just, you know, share our screen, lots of stuff popping up. Um, but again, my name is Whitney Gardner. Um, I am about to have my 14 year anniversary with Manhattan Prep, but I've been teaching um, GMAT uh, since GMAT and GRE since 2006, full time since 2010. Um, and I love these free prep hours. They give us an opportunity to um, discuss things that we don't always have time for in class, um, but that we really do wish that we had more of an opportunity to cover um, with students. So here we are. And this is something I've been doing a lot of in my one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions. Um, because I, I just, I really don't think that any of us are committed um, to doing this like prediction step well enough. Yeah. So let's get jumping in. Um, tonight's lesson on reading comprehension comes from the verbal section of the focus exam. So for those of you that might be a couple of days away from classic reading comp is still part of the classic exam, um, but we'll talk about it more in the context of the focus exam. Same question, no different. It's not treated any differently on focus um, than it is on classic. It's just a, a bigger part of that section. So the verbal section of the focus exam, if taking under standard timing, right? You're not working with accommodation timing. You have 23 questions and 45 minutes. Those 23 questions come from two different question types, critical reasoning and reading comp intermixed. These two questions test two very different skills. And I think that's also really important to discuss. So when we're doing reading comp, reading comprehension are the passages where you have like the long passage that'll be on like the right side of the screen. And then on the left side of the screen, you'll see a question. The passage will stay on the screen as you move through two to four questions per passage. Critical reasoning is going to have a critical reasoning argument at the top. Below that will be a question and five answer choices. One question per critical reasoning prompt or argument. When we're dealing with critical reasoning, we're reading someone's often defensible or sometimes maybe indefensible argument. Um, and that argument is gonna potentially have a conclusion. Our job is to strengthen it or weaken it, evaluate it, point out an assumption or so on. So our job in critical reasoning is to be analytical. It is to read something short, be very attentive to detail, and then likely bring in something new or expect that the answer choices will be bringing in something new. That is the exact opposite of what we'll be doing in reading comprehension. What the skill that they're testing in reading comprehension is a skill of, can I read carefully enough so that I understand what's going on? but I don't get so hung up on the details that I spend forever reading. I don't need to memorize it. The passage will be on the, on the screen the whole time I need it. But when asked for a detail, can I go back into the passage and find that detail? Right? Can, I, can I land on that detail and, and then pick an answer that's going to give me information directly from the passage? Okay, so it is the rare, rare day 
that a reading comp passage, that an answer to reading comp is going to um, present us with something new. We aren't trying to be creative in reading comp. We're trying to show that we're good researchers, that we can find a fact pretty quickly, right? And then match it to an answer choice. So generally for these two types of questions, with critical reasoning, I don't do any predicting. I don't predict answers in critical reasoning because lots of things might strengthen an argument. There's lots of new information out there, right? That would weaken an argument. For reading comp without fail, if they point me to a fact or towards a specific piece of information in the passage, I am 100% going to go back, look it up, and then predict what do I think the answer is going to say based on the literal language in the passage. Yeah. So that's what we'll focus on tonight. We're not going to spend a ton of time talking about how to read, although I will give you some of like you know my preferences in terms of reading. Um, but I can say that for these passages that we'll be reading, generally you're going to have four passages, uh, three to four, but um, for these three to four passages, you want to be able to read them in a minute and a half to two minutes. That is extraordinarily fast. Okay. Now I hesitate to use the word skim because I feel like skimming often means that we aren't connecting to the passage in some way. But we really don't have time to like read and reread and reread. We need usually a little more time in critical reasoning. Um, and so we want to be able to have that like full two minutes per question there. We want to be able to have about a minute and a half per question for reading comp. Um, and we technically want about three, uh, two minutes per question for all questions on the test, like on this verbal section. Um, but we don't quite have that. So we got to come in a little bit faster on reading comp and we have to carve out some time to read on reading comp. So we can't just spend, you know, a, a two, three minutes on each reading comp question. So time is going to be tight on the verbal section of the test. And so again, we want to think about like, how can we be more efficient? So there are really two places that we can work to improve. We can work to improve how we read. We can work to improve how we answer. Now, it's hard to really shift our reading ability, particularly if we're looking at things like vocabulary or, you know, whether we're a native or non-native speaker, right? When did you start learning English? When did you start working in English? And, you know, sort of like what density of English are you accustomed to working in? So passages are typically pretty dense, right? So um, these are going to be written in formal language. These are going to feel very much like journal right, journal or encyclopedia, um, textbook sorts of articles. They will not be written in layman's speak. However, the material should be for the non-specialist, which means if they're writing something about astro astronomy, you don't need to be an astronomist. If they're writing something about, um, you know, dental research, you don't need to be a dentist. <laughs> um, so there will be enough um, language that for uh, an intelligent non-specialist, you can make sense of the passage. But the vocabulary can be quite stout and the text is always dense. And I say this because even I struggle with the density of these passages and I've been reading them for, you know, over a decade. What I wanna encourage you to understand about the read tonight, the only thing I really wanna highlight about reading passages tonight is that we have to learn how to be efficient. And I'm gonna be really honest with you, note-taking is rarely efficient. Um, the most effective notes are written after we have stopped, processed what we've read, sort of made sense of it in our own words, and then we've written it down. That's not usually what people do when they take notes. When people take notes, they often think of this as a frantically sort of jotting down the things that they read. But that means that the time you're spending writing, you're not actually processing what you read. And more often than not, I watch people taking a bunch of notes and they don't actually understand what they're writing down. They're transcribing maybe in shorthand, but they are definitely not um, pausing, processing, sort of collapsing information into a digestible bite, and then writing that bite down. 
So what I want you to be thinking about for reading passages is consider, right? I think it's important to have a pen in your hand. Often I use that pen on the screen and I kind of keep my eyes from moving too quickly. But you might consider that you skip writing for more time processing. And so when I say process, what I mean by that is do I stop I slow down, I think about what I read, and then I try to ask myself, do I understand what that sentence or maybe a couple of sentences means? That moment where I'm like, if I were going to write something down, what would I write down here? That's usually enough, right? Because again, we're only reading this passage for like two minutes, and then we're turning around and we're answering questions with a passage still on the screen. So I don't necessarily, right, for an entire passage plus, let's say, four questions, we're looking at seven minutes, eight minutes total. Now, if you do really struggle with working memory, it, I would say if you're going to write at most, what I would do is a quick table of contents. So you might say, okay, the first paragraph is this right? First paragraph introduces a theory. The second paragraph introduces weaknesses to that theory. The third paragraph introduces competing, co uh, competitive theories, right? Like you don't want to be writing down a note from every sentence. It's going to take you forever. And you will in fact lose the forest for the trees. You'll get too hung up on writing a bunch of details and you will likely miss how those details connect. So first and foremost, I encourage people to at least try not, I mean, I like the pen in my hand, but I don't want to stop to write. I stop to consolidate, right? I stop to think about what I've read and sort of package it. The next tip that I have for reading is that gold information is often out of order. Okay, so what do I mean by this? Um, this is true in critical reasoning as well. I find that the people who write reading comp passages are quite effective at um, giving you information out of order. They give you information from less important to more important, or they give you information from more sort of like weird and generic and unclear to then direct. So, for example, you might read a sentence and think to yourself, like, I, I'm sorry, but I don't actually understand what this means. Rather than fight with a sentence that's confusing, go to the next sentence. Often, the more concrete information that you need, the example or the illustration that you need to make sense of that confusing sentence is in the next sentence. So I find that often reading comp is written so that depth of understanding only comes from getting a little bit more information out of the passage. So don't stay stuck on something that's unclear. Keep pushing to the next sentence. Yeah. Um, and then the sort of last thing I'll say about reading passages is practice, practice, practice. And we've got a lot of sources out there in the world for where you can practice with this level of density. So some um, places where you can find things are the Smithsonian, MAG, Scientific, American. Um, the Economist is sometimes a little bit simplistic, um, but it's a little bit more dense for business, which is great. Um, alumni magazines, can be fantastic sources. So look to see if you know anybody that went to like University of Chicago's got a great one. Harvard's got great ones. Alumni magazines post um, articles about what's happening at their university, what the professors in various departments are doing, but they're posting it for everybody, not just graduates of like the chemistry department or the psychology department, but for all graduates. And so they have to write these articles for the non-specialist but they do still want to talk about what's being done. Now, if you can stomach journal articles, sure, go for it. The, the issue with journal articles is that they're generally for specialists. And so often if you try to read a journal article, they are far too dense. So what we're looking for are practice articles 
from the, again, intelligent non-specialist. Your job is to just practice reading and getting more comfortable with this dense material. I would also say that if you are um, someone who struggles with reading comprehension, that you want to be doing a passage most days, right? So a passage with its questions. Now let's get to the actually, like what I would argue is the most um, effective way to improve. So it can be really hard to improve our reading skill. Um, sorry, my dog is up and moving around, but it can be really hard to improve our reading skill um, because sometimes that really can be um, like dependent, right? Like it can take a long time to speed up our reading while still understanding what we're reading. And so I think that for um, the really good piece of information here, good news here, is that we can get wildly more effective at answering questions, even when we have a sort of limited understanding of the passage. Okay. So even when we're reading the passage and we're like, I'm not, I, I'll be honest, I don't really know what they're talking about here. I mean, I kind of know what, right? Like I, I know that they're saying these words here and these words here and, you know, these other words down here, but like, I don't know what any of it means. And I'm sort of confused as to what any of this means. Even if that's what's happening, we can still play the question game because these questions are predictable. It is a standardized exam. And so for that reason, the answers have to be standardized. The way you search for the answers has to be standardized. So what we're going to talk about in terms of answering questions um, is like two, well, three real cues, right? So the first is that you need to understand the question types. And I'll argue that there are basically two types of questions. There are the questions that ask what was said, and there are the questions that ask why was it said? Okay, so first things first, you have to understand the question types, know which kind of question you're at. That's what we're going to focus on. You need to be very good at finding proof. So your job is to look up the answer. Never answer a question about the passage without going in and researching it. The only exception here is main idea. So unless it's a main idea, right? You will always research answer to a question. Always. And then the third skill, um, I'll, well, actually, I'll, I'll give us four tonight. Third skill is that you want to predict an answer based on that research. And last but not least, we want to use a true process of elimination. And I find that we don't do a great job with elimination if we haven't seen all of the answer choices. So I maybe I'm a little different than some of my colleagues. My general rule of thumb is that I'm happy to have looked at every answer choice before I've even eliminated one. Okay. So I only eliminate, like on my first pass, I only eliminate the most obvious wrong. Generally, I'm going to look at my answers and I'm going to see what I have available. I'm going to see what's out there. And then, right, like once I've seen sort of what's out there, I will then kind of make the assessment of which of these are the worst. And then I'll fight it out between what, whatever's left, between or among whatever's left. Okay. We're going to do this. So let's start. Um, we're going to do a passage. Grab one for us. Okay. So we'll start by reading. When a passage hits the screen, I'll argue that there's not a ton of benefit in trying to um, like read ahead in the question because we can only see one question at a time. We can't see all of the questions. And so generally I might look at um, like what the, the first question kind of mentions or says, um, but often 
I I will just just kind of like go after it, right? And see what I, I've I've got to work on. Okay, so what I'd like to do, let's start. Um, mm -mm -mm. Yeah, so let's go with this passage. And then I'll put it on the screen. I'm going to set a timer. I'd like for you to practice, if this is not something you've done before, I want you to practice reading this passage without writing down much. What I do want you to know by the end of this passage, I'd like for you to have a sense of kind of where everything is, just like maybe a mental table of contents. This is only one paragraph, so you're not going to be able to use kind of paragraph structure. So you might want to say like, okay, in the beginning, we talk about this, and then in the middle, it sort of talks about this thing, and then at the end, it talks about this other thing. Okay, um, let's do it. Here is your passage. I'm going to get you a timer. This is a short passage. Our goal is to finish this in a minute and a half. Yeah. So if you have standard timing, um, you would scale that up if you had 1.5x or 2x accommodation. Yeah. All right. So let me get you a timer going and begin. All right, so that's a minute and a half. How'd this passage feel? Enough time to sort of read it? To feel like you knew what was going on? Minute and a half is quick. Great. Now, I said that I rarely write things down. I do have one exception. And this passage gives a sort of good example of that. I still don't know what I would have written down for this one, but sometimes when a passage, whether it's reading comp or critical reasoning, sets up like a cause and effect or sort of a mathematical relationship between things, I might jot down a note so that I can visualize that. So for example, how the beginning of this says that they assume that the size of herds is inversely related to serial production. I don't know what that means. Um, they, they do sort of explain it after the colon, but I might right? Like as an animal herd goes up, cereal production goes down and vice versa. And then the second part of this gives the example of like, oh, I either have room for my, my animals or I have room for a crop, one or the other. Right? So I can either grow grain or I can grow animals. Right. Once I've got that, off I go. But sometimes when they give me mathematical relationships, I might jot a note down about that so that I can kind of visualize like, oh, okay, I think I see what this means. Okay. So once we finish the passage, our job is then to move into the questions. And so our first question um, is referencing a highlighted portion. And so our next step, if you will, of questions is exactly the way I listed, right? So when I said 
that what we want to do is understand the question type, find proof, predict an answer, use process of elimination. That is the literal order of steps that we're going to attack questions. So once we've read, we want to figure out, okay, what type of question are we dealing with? Where do I find proof for an answer to this question? How do I predict my answer? What do I predict? And then let's use a process of elimination. So this takes some restraint. So the types of questions, I want to add these in for us here. I argue that there are, in fact, two types, two primary types of what questions. So the first is a specific detail. So this is where they're going to point us directly to something. They're going to say the author states, the passage states, this thing that was mentioned, like pull up a fact, right? So when we've got something like a specific detail, right? So the historian mentioned in the highlighted text cites which of the following, says which of the following as evidence for the existence of a pastoral crisis in the 13th century. This is a lookup, right? This is a detail lookup. So this one was kind enough to give us highlighted text. So when it comes to finding proof, I'm not going to pretend I remember. Even if I did take notes, I'm not going to use my notes to create my answer. My notes are only to help me either better understand the passage or to find things more easily. But I'm going to go back in and I'm going to try and find an answer of my own before I actually look at the answers that are given. So. Thus, right, thus one historian has postulated, this refers back to a previous sentence. So when pointed towards a fact, I usually read the sentence before it and then through like the sentence it's in or maybe the sentence after. So we know that the first sentence is this inverse relationship. What is our inverse relationship between size of animal herds and how like the size of the crops that I could grow? Therefore, because of this inverse relationship or the belief, this assumption of this inverse relationship, one historian has postulated, come up with, theorized that there must have been some sort of crisis in the 13th century, right? Why? Well, the amount of pasture land must have diminished because cereal harvests are known to have increased, right? So, there must have been, according to this, the historian mentioned, cites which of the following as evidence for the existence of a pastoral crisis. This historian postulated a pastoral crisis, arguing that pastoral, um, the amount of pasture land and herd size must have diminished since cereal harvests are known to have increased. So pastoral crisis, Evidence of that would be that um, the evidence, right, some factual piece, well, this must have diminished is a theory. The conclusion here is since cereal harvests are known to have increased. So the, the historian must be saying that, okay, there is this pastoral crisis. We're not going to have enough pasture land because cereal harvests went up. We were able to harvest more cereal. Therefore, there must have been a pastoral crisis. Once you've predicted your answer, then I would scan all of the answer choices. You're looking for a match, eliminating anything that doesn't fit. So what am I looking for? I'm looking for cereal harvest have known to increase. Cereal harvests are known to increase. We are, for reading comp, often not as concerned with the like full depth of like, why are the wrong answers wrong? Because for the most part, wrong answers are wrong because they just completely miss the mark in terms of the facts of the passage. Okay? So in this case, our only match here is C. Now this farmer's decision to devote less land to pasturage, that might be something that we could infer, right? That if we 
you know, if you were crop farming, you couldn't use it for pasturing animals, but it wasn't stated. It wasn't mentioned, right? It wasn't fully stated. And other things like rising wool prices, that's, you know, later. That wasn't part of this piece. <clears throat> okay, so I want to give you a chance to try another of these, same passage, but we're going to look at the second type of what I call a what question. And it's actually the question that most people confuse. So this is a question that people often misinterpret. So when you see the language the passage suggests, what comes to mind for you? If a question says like the passage suggests, Yeah. Okay. So I love this. So folks are bringing this up in the background that it's like, it's not actually going to be stated, right? It doesn't actually say this. We have to infer it. We have to draw our own conclusion. We have to be creative with the language. We are going to be coming up with information on our own. Guess what? That is not how the GMAT works. So even when it says the passage suggests, this is yet another what what does the passage actually say? So we're going to add this to our list of lookup questions. We have the specific detail and we have the inference suggests question type. Now, it may not be stated exactly, but it will be stated in some form of like synonymous language. The way we infer on the GMAT is only what can be what I'd call legally inferred, meaning we're not allowed to tiptoe outside of the passage. We have to stick to the bounds of the passage, right? They may not say it in the exact same words, but they're going to say it in very similar words. <clears throat> so first, we need to go look at the passage and or the question and ask, where are we going to find this answer? So we want the view of most economic historians, right? So in their view, most economic historians, what must be true of medieval farmers who devoted a larger part of their land to pasturing animals? So where do we talk about what most economic historians believe? What do we know about what most economic historians would believe? Yes. So economic historians usually believe, they usually assume. Right. This is their view. What do they usually believe? That the size of the animal herds is inversely related to cereal production. So I might jot down a note for myself here. Here's what they believe. Is that if animal is up, then cereal is down. And vice versa. If animal production is down, then cereal production is higher. So what does the passage suggest that what would be true of farmers who devote a larger portion of their land to pasturing animals? They must use less land right, for cereal production. They must have lower cereal production. That's my prediction. The answer to this question is going to be something along the lines of their cereal production is lower. And then send me your answer when you think you've got it. And does it match? Were we able to predict?
Nice. Okay, so, so far everyone has given me an answer and has said, all right, it's definitely not about wool prices. It is not about the allocation of land, their lands being typical of other farmers. I have no information about that. And I don't know about their access to markets. So here's what we have. B sticks very closely to the tiny little thing we know, which is if animal, you know, herds were bigger, if the, they devoted more to animal herds, less to cereal, more to cereal, less to animal herds. So if they devoted a larger portion of their land to pasturing animals, it must have been a smaller amount to cereal. Their farms produce a proportionally smaller amount of cereal. E indicates a why. That, that there's a reason for why they did it this way, that maybe it's because cereal prices were low. And so instead of growing cereal, they should instead raise um, animals. <laughs> while that might be true, and while we discuss much later the possible reasons for why a farm might choose to pasture more animals, all we know about what economic historians believe is this little bit at the top. That's it. That's all we know. Nowhere else do we know anything about what most economic historians believe. So I want to be extraordinarily careful of stepping outside of that. The only thing that pulls just what we know is answer choice B. Okay. So I want you to practice. We're going to do another passage. We're going to do, um, let's go. <clears throat> yeah, let's go this one. We're going to do a passage that's a little bit businessy, but it's longer. Now, here's the deal. This passage is substantially longer. Instead of one paragraph, it's three, but you don't get much more time to read it. You get two minutes. So that means that we need to be moving at a relatively quick pace. There are going to be a lot of details you miss that you don't fully understand. So your job is just to figure out where are things, where is the information, so that when I'm asked about it, I can go back and find it, okay? And then with this passage, we'll also look at the other type of question, not just the what questions, but we will also look at the why questions. We've got two of those types as well. All right, so here is the passage. I'm going to give you your stopwatch. Two minutes, right? This goes quite quickly. Might let this run up to like 220, but it'll cut us off.
All right. So we're at 220, just over two minutes. How does this feel for enough time to read and understand? This one feels good. You wanted a little more time, plenty of time. Let me know in the chat window. Okay, maybe enough time, hopefully enough time. All right. So. Um, for this passage, we're going to start with several inference questions. Again, our goal is to see that just because it says inference does not mean that we will not be given the answer to this question almost directly. Okay. So even when it says inference, it still is something that we can pull directly from the passage. So let's start with this one. It can be inferred that the author would characterize the activities engaged in by early chartered trading companies as being what? So where does our author start to give an opinion about the activities engaged in by early chartered trading companies? Where might she have mentioned that in the passage? Mmm, nice. So we do start to hear about these 16th and 17th century chartered trading companies in the first paragraph. And it says are usually considered irrelevant to this discussion, and they explain why. But the passage then says, in reality, however, these early trading companies successfully purchased and outfitted ships, built and operated Amazon, manufactured, da, 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 maintained trading posts and production facilities overseas, procured goods, sold these goods, right? Like there's lots here, right? The large volume of transactions associated with these activities seems to have necessitated structures well before their advent. So what would you predict? I want you to type it in the chat window for me. How do you think the author characterizes these activities? Especially based on the fact that it feels like a disagreement with what is often considered to be true. And go ahead and type it in. What would you think? How would she characterize the activities engaged in by early chartered trading companies? Okay, good. I love that. That's a great guess. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. These are so good. I'm going to start to put some of these on the board, by the way. Um, keep them coming. Oops. Uh, here we go. So far, these are awesome. Yep. So good. And then uh, another one that was relatively similar to that first one. Um, this other one is more complicated than they seemed or not too primitive, a response to this right, that they were often considered, you know, too primitive to make comparisons with modern multinationals interesting. So we want that they're more extensive, they're more complicated, they call for um, hierarchical management structure, so they needed more management involvement. Great. Now that we have a clear picture in our minds of what we think the answer should be, pull in.
Beautiful. And I want to know, did it feel easier to eliminate answers or to choose one? Does it feel like the right answer stands out a bit more? Because our goal here when we predict is for the correct answer to sort of pop off the screen a bit more. So yeah, right. It's the only, so the only answer that talks about there being a need for ne necessitated hierarchical management structures and the only answer choice to sort of indicate that like, well, so we can, first we know that they mentioned that this would not be that they were too simple. We don't know anything about the unprofitable. If we stick to this piece, we don't have anything about profitability or about their hampering of political demands if we stay to the fact that we've got. Now, are they as intricate as those carried out by the largest multi? Oh, I don't know. That, that might be a bit of a stretch. But if we look at A, A gives us they are complex enough in scope. They're more complex than we thought to require a substantial amount of planning and coordination from management that they did in fact need management structures. They needed organization, right? There was a lot more happening. So even when they talk about an inference, this is still like, we wanna be able to prove it, right? From the passage. So these can sometimes be more generic, right? Um, so let's try, we've got just a couple more questions for this passage. So for example, where are we going to find the answer to this, oops, don't want to change my share, here we go, to this question. This feels really generic. Where do we learn about a generalization of a management structure? Where do we hear about management structures? Yeah, we have it actually in two places. So the first time we ever hear about management structures, and I, I point this out the first occurrence, because often when something is mentioned repeatedly in a passage, we, we often just kind of want to look at some of the earliest mentions of that thing, right? So we've got teams of salaried managers organized into hierarchies, right? So we've got, you know, the modern multinational corporation is this guy that described as having originated when the owner managers were replaced by teams of salary managers, right? And it was that these increases in transactions would have ne necessitated that change. Then we've also got the mention down here of these would have necessitated hierarchical management structures, right? And so we've got this the large volume of transactions seems to have necessitated these. So same sort of place again, that there's all these things that had to be done, right? And so what we want is to think about like teams of salary managers got organized and the large volume of transactions associated with all these things necessitates a hierarchical manager structure, management structure. So it's gonna be something along those lines. like. Management structures, um, it might be because of an increase, it seems like, increase in the volume of transactions. Volume of transactions necessitates structural change, necessitates structural change. So it must be something along the lines of a large volume of transactions necessitates a hierarchy. Okay, let's see. Do we have an answer choice that somewhere says large number of transactions would necessitate a, his, a hierarchical management structure.
And once again, once you've got a clear picture in your mind, I mean, we didn't pull any new language. We didn't get fancy. We didn't get creative. We literally just pulled the language from the passage. Right? Even if we didn't know what that meant, we just pulled the language from the passage. Were you able to find an answer that pretty well matched? Or did it at least feel easy to eliminate a fair number of answer choices? I would argue that we did a really good job here. <laughs> okay. um, do we have any evidence in either of these that say that hierarchical management structures are the most efficient management structures possible? Mm, that seems pretty extreme. Firms that routinely have a high volume of business transactions find it necessary to adopt I mean, they do say that a high volume of transactions necessitates the change. It's kind of exactly what it says. Hierarchical managers, management structures cannot be successfully intimate, implemented without modern communication. Seems like they did have them back then. Modern multinational firms with a small volume of business do not. Oh, okay, that's that same high volume do, maybe high, low volume don't. We'll leave it. Companies that adopt these structures usually do so in order to facilitate expansion into foreign trade. We only know the connection to these large volume of transactions. So I think that this would help us eliminate. Mm -hmm. Now, here's what we don't know. We do know that firms that do have a high volume of transaction necessitate the structural change. We don't know that they wouldn't adopt that without it. So we wanna be really careful. D is a fantastic trap here, but the direct language we've been given would indicate that B is our correct answer. All right, let's look at one more inference and then we'll look at the two why type questions. We can kind of move those through those pretty quickly. So I want you to try this one fully on your own. You have the answer choices. If you have about a minute and a half, I want you to actively try to predict, okay? So take a moment to go into the argument first. All right, as we roll into about a minute 45, what I'd like for you to do is send me your answer privately. And how did it go? I've gotten one answer in. So let's let's talk about a trick that the GMAT likes to pull with these suggest or infer questions. And it's what you might call like a reversal. Notice that the question says, the passage suggests that modern multinationals differ from early chartered trading companies in that. So the... And if we look at all of our answer choices, it's the top managers of modern, 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 modern. Our answer choices are all describing what's true for modern multinationals. So we do have a section of the 
passage where we compare modern multinationals and how they differ from early trading companies, that happens down here. Notice the they though, in right, the question is asking us for a trait of a modern multinational. The paragraph is telling us the traits of the early trading companies. And so the answer is going to be the opposite, right? These are the things that are true of trading companies. So what I want to be thinking about here, yeah, nice, nice fix there, is, all right, if the trading company, and so here I might kind of jot down a note as I think through it, the trading company, so the first, they depended on the national government and so therefore promoted national interests, depended on um, government plus promoted national interest. It must mean then that modern multinationals do, do not depend on government and are, do not necessarily promote national interest. Um, they are top managers are typically owners with a minority share, whereas current modern multinationals are insignificant, right? So if I want to do multi, I would say they um, do not depend on the government, um, do not promote national interest, right? I want to write the opposite. In this case, they have um, insignificant ownership, right, their share, their holdings. These early trading companies operated in a pre-industrial world, right, um, grafting this system of capitalist international trade onto a pre-modern system of artisan peasant production. So it seems like maybe, you know, more naturally, not entirely sure what the opposite of that is, but more naturally capitalist, right? They're not sort of trying to combine it with they're not dealing with an old world. They're dealing in a world where like maybe everybody is sort of working in a capitalist space. Um, and so as we start to look through our answer choices, the top managers own stock in their company. No, I mean, they may, but it's not rather than just receiving a salary. That's not the difference. They depend on a system of capitalist international trade rather than less modern. Maybe let's leave that. They have operations in a number of different foreign countries rather than one or two. They don't, um, say anything about how many countries the operations are highly profitable despite uh, we don't know anything about regulations and the overseas operations are not governed by the national interests of their home countries well that we do know they don't depend on their government and they're not promoting the national interests of their own countries so e is definitely here and so what we're looking for is like e comes pretty directly from this language um i don't know Right. This says that modern multinationals depend on a system of capitalist international trade. But it seems like down here, these did have to graft a system of capitalist internationalist trade. So it wouldn't seem that this was a difference. The difference isn't that they were using capitalist international trade, but that maybe modern don't have to combine that with less modern trading systems in ways that previous had to kind of combine them. And so the one that comes more directly, like almost word for word from the passage is actually E, right? That fits this inverse item, right? It would be the inverse of the fact that early trading companies did depend heavily on their national governments tricky, very, very tricky. Okay. So with our last just a couple of minutes, I wanted to highlight the other two types of questions um, that are both what we'll call a why question. And so the first and most obvious, I think, why question, at least for most people, is the main idea question. And so when we're dealing with a main idea, like main point or main idea, this is the one question type that we don't need to go back into the passage to find proof for. The fact that we've read it is traditionally enough. So you do, though, want to take a moment just to, you know, make sure that you're clear in your mind of what the passage is about. For these, you want to be relatively quick because we're not looking up proof. So generally, we want to be able to answer these in about 45 seconds.
है मैंने And so generally, again, I want to make my way through um, kind of reading and checking through most of the um, answer choices before I make any hard and fast decisions. So what's the author's main point? Well, it would seem like the first paragraph shows what most people think and that we don't really care about early trading companies. But the second and the third paragraph seem to show that early trading companies were important. And in fact, we have this like lovely opinion, which doesn't always happen. We don't always get opinions in our, our passages, but if we get one, we want to think about it. But the opinion we've got is this, despite these differences, however, early trading companies um, organize effectively in remarkably modern ways and merit further study as analogs, right? They merit further study. Like most people ignored them right? Despite are usually considered irrelevant, but in reality, however, right? So it would appear that at every turn, our author seems to think that maybe they do deserve to be looked at as origin, like original when it comes to these, um, the beginning of a multinational, right? Modern multinational. So it's definitely not that um, the author doesn't think that they originated there, the modern ones did, just maybe that they have their roots there, and the it's not about the success, <clears throat> excuse me, depending on their complex operations. Early chartered trading companies should be more seriously considered by scholars. They do merit further study. So that would fit, we'll leave it. Saying that scholars are quite mistaken concerning their origins a little strong. And that the management structures of early chartered trading companies are fundamentally the same as those. Well, they are similar. But I think we need to be careful with the language of are fundamentally the same. They aren't necessarily saying they're the same. They are just saying that they are precursors. In fact, there's a lot of evidence that they're not quite the same. They just have a lot of similarities. So we want to be careful. E is a little bit too strong. C would be our correct answer. Okay. So we want to take them more seriously, but maybe we need to be a little careful of like, no, they're the exact same. So as we get into this like space of a why question, the two types of why questions are these main ideas. So this is the one we just did, main idea, primary purpose. The second, and this is the last question we'll do for the evening, are what we'll call specific purpose. And they almost always use the language in order to. Okay, so um, they may start off sounding like they're going to be a specific detail, but generally they kind of quickly become like they'll almost always end with a why or in order to or purpose. So you'll see the language here, right? We've got the author lists the various activities of these um, early chartered trading companies in order to. So we talk about all the things they did, right? So the author brings up all of these things. So many of these things. Why? We're gonna hybrid this between a main idea and a specific detail. We're gonna go in here and ask why? What was the point that the author was trying to make with these details? Usually it follows immediately from them or comes right before, right? Like if they're pointing us towards examples, notice that it says the large volume of transactions associated seems to have necessitated hierarchical management structures well before the advent of the things that we expect. So we might want to look for something along the lines of they mentioned all these things so that we could see how complex and see the motivation to, to provide evidence that these early trading companies could have actually been precursors to some of these multinational corporations, that we shouldn't be ignoring them, that the volume of their transactions was not too low, and that the communications too primitive 
that they may in fact have been way more complex than we thought. And so here we go, your answer choices for these. So we've got a sentence that is sort of followed by the large volume of transactions associated seems to have necessitated. It also, I should point out, is acting as a rebuttal, right? In reality, however, right? It's a response. The author listed the various activities both to show that this large volume of transactions does seem to have necessitated hierarchical management structure. They also mention it as a rebuttal to this, the volume of their transactions is assumed to have been too low and communication too primitive. So are we analyzing the ways in which these activities contributed to changes in management structure in such companies? Maybe. Let's leave it. Are we demonstrating that the volume of transactions exceeded that of earlier firms? Oh, I don't think so. We might leave that one. Refute the view. Okay, it is here as a refutation that the volume of business undertaken by these companies was low. It does. Yes, because they this says they thought it was too low. Here they're saying, no, that large volume wasn't too low. Emphasize the international scope. Support the argument that these firms coordinated them by using the available means of communication? No. So we've got these top three, A, B, and C. Are we analyzing the way? So we need to look a little bit more deeply. For A to be the correct answer, they would have to show how each of these actually led to a change. So because they had to do this, they did this. Because they had to do this, they did this. Because they had to do this, they did this. So we aren't actually using them to analyze how the change happened, not this list. We talk about how some of that change might have happened later, but not in this specific example. Now, I don't know if it exceeded earlier firms. It probably did, but I'm not entirely sure. Because this is a statement of like, actually, this thing, this earlier statement's wrong, our closest answer for the why. So, right, we want to be careful when we're dealing with an in order to, we're not trying to say what was said, but why. What is this in service of? And so this is in service of saying this earlier statement was wrong. They were wrong. The... The transactions aren't too low. And so this was here to re refute the view that the volume of businesses undertaken by such companies was relatively low. All right. Thank you all so much for coming and hanging out. If you have not yet signed up for a free prep hour, by all means, you absolutely can. Um, you can sign up for that by coming to our website, um, you can sign up under uh, the MPREP GMAT classes free, lots and lots and lots of free classes that you can sign up for there. Um, you can try out, um, I'll just highlight for you, if you come to our main website, so if you go to, um, let me get this open for you, if you come to the Manhattan Prep website, and log in. You can come here to GMAT Prep. Once there, if you come down to our free classes and events,
You can attend, um, our foundation of math is also free, but our free classes and events, you can come in and see your details for any of our free prep hours. Or if you'd like to attend a session one of any of our full course classes, you can find those here as well. Yeah. So come join us, come take free practice exams, right? Come, come try out our stuff. Hopefully we'll see you around the water cooler soon. Happy new year again. Um, and have a lovely rest of your evening. Thanks so much for hanging out with us.